Welcome to you today. I'm Steve Shankman, director of the Oregon Humanities Center. And our guest today is Dave Fronmeyer, the president of the University of Oregon. Dave, it's always really good to see you. Well, our greetings for fall term to you and our, our viewers, Steve. It's always a great pleasure to be with you well, at thank, this time. Thank, thank you. There's a lot, lot going on. We've got a lot to, uh, to talk about. Tell us, first of all, about enrollment. There seems to be a lot of students around. Well, it's great to see the students back in the, in the streets, in the, in the alleys, in the, in the classrooms. I, I think we'll have a strong enrollment uh, when we come to the October, uh, fourth week in October census, which is the, uh, always the official time. But a, a good showing of Oregon, Oregon residents, uh, maybe a little bit more than expected of non-resident students, and uh, uh, just a, a really nice uh, atmosphere. Of the, 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 the residence halls are full or nearly full, so we, we, we've, we've judged right in terms of our anticipation for this, uh, this fall, and it just ev everything feels good. Good, good. Uh, retainment or, uh, of students, ret uh, retention of students, yeah. retention of students, that are, 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 is that a concern of the university? I think we, I think we lose about 15% a year, uh, yeah, which well, seems to be not, not a bad percentage. Yeah, every student you lose, you wonder, you know, has this soul been lost, or is that person going to actually, is this a stop out rather than a drop out? And I think in many, maybe most cases, it is. Uh, but we always want to improve our retention rate. It's by far the best in the state system of higher education, and it's probably 20% above the national average. Mm -hmm. But it certainly doesn't approach that of, of uh, some of the private schools that, that really have uh, programs that are specially geared for, for that student who might be feeling insecure. And that's, that's a place where I think we really can make some improvement, uh, even this year, even mm -hmm. though we, our records are really pretty good. Mm -hmm. uh, l let's talk about the increased funding. I think we're up, is it? 22 percent this year? Is that well, correct? depending on the, how you. Yeah, it's it's a little bit hard to measure it, and we don't want to be misled into uh -huh. complacency because uh, while the overall state system of higher education budget was in double digits, um, ours as an institution, for reasons that are explainable but exasperating, is the smallest of the, any of the seven Oregon University mm -hmm. system institutions. So on the whole, we're up probably about 12 percent. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's still welcome news. Uh, we have a governor and a legislature that really have. Uh, realize that building back higher education is the investment they need to make in, in a healthy society for the future. And that trajectory is the first time it has been reversed really since I became president mm -hmm. now uh, 14 years ago, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. So that part feels good in terms of at least changing the direction in a positive way. Uh, so why are we why are we lower down in terms of in relative to the other institutions well the other institutions the the regional institutions get what's called a small school subsidy mm -hmm. uh, uh, the uh, Oregon State University gets uh, additional money from the general fund for statewide services such as extension um, and frankly because of the emphasis on engineering uh, and educational technology there's probably a a $20 million appropriation of money in which we share $500,000. Mm -hmm. So many of the things that we do best uh, have not uh, turned up on that particular sub-priority list, and that mm -hmm. certainly dictates our agenda for the next time around. Mm -hmm. In fact, we're really already working on it. So what about with this, with this increase in funding about faculty salaries? Because we're still, I think we're still pretty low in, 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 uh, in reference to in comparison to some of our yeah. competitors, what's anything being done on that front? Well, we're, we're working actually as as I speak uh, on on that issue to determine what among the many competing priorities we're going to be able to address and how completely to do it. Salaries we will address. Actually, in terms of total compensation, our faculty is now at the so-called white paper average, mm -hmm. uh, which is very heartening. But that includes a benefit package that's say forty percent of salary. Uh, whereas many institutions, most of them really are at about 25 percent. But in terms of those things that you use to buy your groceries or send your uh, children to college or to, to go on family vacations, um, we're still not where we need to be, especially with people in the upper ranks at the university, mm -hmm. the people who've paid their dues, the people who, who, who are uh, heads of departments and so forth. So uh, we really need to be working on that particular sub-equity uh, you know, sub uh, issue. No question that we'd like to do more, uh, but but uh, we're going to try to do justice by our faculty and certainly to address issues such as graduate education support and mm -hmm. other priorities that also demand attention if we're going to keep up with our competitors and provide the overall academic learning environment that our faculty want to thrive in. Well, where do you get those funds if they're not coming from the state? I mean, we had a 12 percent increase, but that's obviously not enough. Yeah. Well, I tell you, the, increasingly, the, the, the wave of the future, and we, we have to have the state and we have to have an increase there. 
But this last year, we got more money from private philanthropy, more money from student tuition, and more money uh, from the federal government for research separately as appropriations uh, or, or, or sources of money than we did from the state. Mm -hmm. So the, the state funding is just about 13% of our overall budget, and our overall budget is more than a half billion dollars a year now. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. uh, we're talking really about a huge secular shift in the balance between, say, students and the state mm -hmm. in one, uh, on one hand, and certainly a huge infusion of private philanthropy, which is, has gone for such things as faculty salary awards mm -hmm. and the recognition of excellent faculty, mm -hmm. particularly in the last year, something we will do again uh, really in, in the next probably six to eight weeks. You mentioned tuition. Uh, what about tuition? And is it going to stay where it is? Is it going to be increased? Uh, tuition is pretty stable. It's uh -huh. about 3.4 percent this year and scheduled for something like 3.4 percent. This is over the system mm -hmm. for uh, next year. Mm -hmm. uh, and a vastly increased uh, student financial aid um, uh, appropriation, which oh, which is one of the ways I think that we can help keep pace. That, that doesn't show up in our budget, but in, in essence it shows up in our bottom line because another agency appropriates it. So I think that the strategic use of financial aid, which is much improved from where it was just last year, uh, is going to show up in a positive way in, in our overall environment for student retention, uh, for the sense of affordability and so forth. And where do the student aid increases come from? Uh, you know, they, they, they come from a separate agency in Oregon, mm -hmm. you know, the Oregon Student Assistance Fund, uh, which is a separate agency, mm -hmm. but, uh, but acts in essence as a lending bank for public and private institutions. And that appropriation increased vastly uh, in this last legislature. So even though that's not in our budget, it will have the effect of assisting our budget because the students who come to us will have that resource. Uh, now, people have been talking about student fees, additional student fees, and in fact, Senator Vicki Walker, I think, was, was concerned about you know, what, what exactly are these fees. Can you say something about what the, what the additional student fees are for? Yeah, and that's a little bit of a truth and packaging issue, and it's mm -hmm. a little bit of the total cost of education issue. Um, in fact, it reached the attention of the New York Times some, some time ago. We try to be very upfront with our, with our students about here's what your total bill is going to be because you have an incidental fee, you may have a technology fee, there may be special fees for the Honors College, special fees for a student who wants to be in a, in a business honors program and so forth. And uh, the law school has a, a, a resource fee that's over and above the tuition that students pay. Um, but, but A, we try to do that well in advance and B, we try to make sure that students are aware of it. But, but there is a sentiment abroad uh, and Senator Walker's committee certainly um, uh, has urged us to look at it and we have a task force working as I speak now to see whether or not it makes more sense to roll those into the tuition bill overall mm -hmm. uh, or to have some different way of assessing it. Um, and there are arguments on both sides. Uh, on, on one hand, uh, some students don't want to pay for a service they don't get yeah. and are happy to pay a fee for one that they will. Mm -hmm. And so why should that be part of everyone's tuition is, is one of the arguments. Uh, on the other hand, you don't want to price students out of their ability to take a major because that's a costly major as opposed to a relatively inexpensive major. So these are, are tough policy questions and they're ones that every institution of higher education faces, but particularly state institutions. So we, we expect to be working actively with the, the task force that Senator Walker commissioned and mm -hmm. I expect we'll have some, some more, uh, more positive kinds of, of outcomes uh, uh, probably by the end of this term, but certainly by the end of this year. Uh, I'd like to talk about the, the leadership at the Art Museum, the Jordan Schnitzer mm -hmm. Art Museum. Uh, recently, the museum was transferred from reporting, uh, re uh, in reporting from the academic side to the fundraising and development side of the institution. You want to explain exactly why that happened? Sure. And, and I, I think in terms of historical perspective, I've, I've been at the university or around it long enough to remember the many, many years, in fact, most of the years I've been associated when it actually reported to the vice president for administration. So changing its reporting structure simply changes the way in which uh, information comes to me. But in the, in, in the ultimate sense, uh, I as president am still accountable for the art museum. So this is a question of the line to which it reported. Mm -hmm. um, in, in this particular atmosphere, most of uh, the, the, the possibilities for the museum to have a better budget, in fact, come from external sources. And it seemed to me that if that's the challenge and that's the opportunity, that at least in, in this immediate uh, uh, area that we ought to that that, that transfer for made sense. And it was done with the full consensus mm -hmm. of both the provost and of the vice president for advancement. Is that permanent? Not necessarily. Uh -huh. uh, what's really important is that we make sure that the search for a new museum director uh, is uh, 
taken to a speedy and thoughtful, uh, thoughtful conclusion. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's something that's very much weighed on my mind. And it did when we made the change to make sure that at least that process doesn't delay the change of leadership uh, any more than it, than it has to. Because it's, it's clear that, that in many respects the museum, at least internal to the campus and external to our larger community, wasn't meeting anybody's expectations. Mm -hmm. That's a leadership issue. Uh, and it certainly is a new leadership issue that we need to get our teeth into. We have a consultant's report that's very thorough uh, that identifies issues that need to be addressed, uh, including basic things such as having a value statement and a mission statement. Those are things that we really won't be able to do well until we have new leadership on board. Mm -hmm. And that imperative really drives my present thinking about the museum. And uh, when, when, when can we expect to have a new uh director of the museum on board? Well, I'm told by the head of the search committee and, and by, by its members that it's actually a very strong field. Mm -hmm. And my hope would be that in the next weeks, certainly uh, I hope by the end of the term, we will have had campus visits and a thorough vetting of, of what appear to be really excellent candidates mm -hmm. and, and to make a choice and make a selection and get down to the business of mm -hmm. deciding some of these fundamental questions about rearticulation of mission uh, in, in a way that, that meets the needs of, of a lot of people internal to the uh, university who, who see it, and rightly so, as a resource for students, for scholarship, mm -hmm. for exhibitions, and external to a larger community that, that sees this as the largest, maybe only, uh, art uh, history and art uh, exhibiting resource uh, between Portland and San Francisco of any size. Mm -hmm. Now, am I right in thinking that there's a, an appeal that's going to come up in the Senate about, about your decision to turn this over to the... To the, to the uh, uh, to the uh, development uh, people, uh, the, the the leadership of the museum. Is, I don't. I don't know. I, mean, oh, I, 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 I understand see. that some some faculty are concerned about the move, and they've they've, right. they've written about bringing this issue to the Senate. Mm -hmm. And obviously, if that if that's their choice, I welcome it, and we'll certainly have a discussion there. Mm -hmm. But um, I think the the imperative is to make sure that we have leadership in place that broadly meets the needs of of a variety of of people who are calling for mm -hmm. uh, appropriately for attention. Mm -hmm. And I think we can do that. Yeah. Uh, the university, of course, very big news, has received you know, this astounding gift, a pledge of $100 million from Phil and Penny Knight for the uh, uh, Oregon Athletics Legacy Fund. I think, it's the, is it the largest philanthropic gift uh, ever for the University of Oregon? Well, it's not only the largest for the University of Oregon, but it may well the be state. the largest in Oregon history mm -hmm. by, by a living donor to, to a program that's other than you know, an, an estate bequest. Wow. So certainly what this does, first of all, is, is guarantee to the extent that any you know, mortals can do that, that there won't be any uh, reversion back to, to using education and general funds for the subsidy of intercollegiate athletics. Mm -hmm. We're one of the very few institutions in the United States that can say that now. And in fact, we were singled out by the Chronicle of Higher Education, which uh, interviewed me actually earlier today. They said, mm -hmm. you know, Oregon's phenomenal. How do you do this? How did this happen? Yeah. Uh, and uh, I, I, I think the tone of their article, which has yet to be uh, written, will, will be quite uh, commendatory for our capacity to to insulate the academic side of the university from the vicissitudes of mm -hmm. successful or unsuccessful teams, and to provide a self-sustaining way for intercollegiate athletics to pr uh, proceed at a high level of excellence while still not impairing the central academic mission of the university. Well, I want to get back to the, to the Legacy Fund in, in, in a moment, but I, I want to address the issue of, of donors, because we've been, we've been talking about that. You said that we get so little money from the state that obviously we have to get money from somewhere, and so we turn to donors, generous donors like, like the Knights, or to Jordan Schnitzer, who made the, 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 uh, this new museum uh, possible, the, the renovations of the museum possible. Are you concerned about the, uh, uh, the problem of the influence of donors in this new climate, or at least the perception of the influence of donors in, in this new climate. How does how does one uh, respond to uh, uh, people's questions about whether people who, who give money have, uh, uh, say, an inordinate amount of influence on the direction of the university? Where where does one where does one find the fine line there? Now you find it carefully. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, and uh, you, you raise two separate issues, and they're yeah. real. Uh, the first issue is the perceptions, and I, I'm not sure what we can do about the perception mm -hmm. because many of them are, are born of lack of knowledge of what the, the donor has actually done. Uh, and, and the second is, uh, in, in reality, we, we have very, uh, uh, very clear restrictions on, on what can be a condition of a gift and what can't be, and, and gifts actually can be appealed um, mm -hmm. to uh, the University of Oregon Foundation, which which ensures at the outset 
when the gift is received that there will be uh, appropriate, not inappropriate conditions. The second thing is that donors give for their purposes and, they, and, and we marry them to ours. And happily, we found great marriages in, mm -hmm. in these cases. But money that's given to intercollegiate athletics is given because that may be for that purpose, the, the person's passion. Mm -hmm. and, and to suggest that that should be diverted for some other purpose, uh, even though it, it, it may be one that's highly desirable, is something that really would violate trust law as mm -hmm. well as uh, essential elements of, of trust. What about the perception issue? I mean, is that just something people have to work out for themselves? Can the I, university do anything about perception issues or are they just yeah, out I th there? Well, I mean, it, it's hard to know exactly what to do mm -hmm. other than, um, you know, in my experience as university president, we have been really utterly free of the kinds of, of horror stories that one can read about occasionally in the Chronicle of Higher Education. Mm -hmm. that, that our donors give for their purpose when, when the gift agreement is completed. The gift is complete. Uh, we, we don't have any take backs. Mm -hmm. and, and under the law of, of, of trust, that gift is, is given really in perpetuity on, mm -hmm. in, in most of the, the, the gifts that, that are of any significance. So, you know, I, everyone who provides resources to the university has some kind of, of purposes and we hope that they're all noble and we watch carefully to make sure that our central mission isn't warped. Uh, but I can tell you that we've had tougher battles with Ways and Means Committees of the Oregon Legislature or with, uh, with congressional regulation of the direction of federal funds than we ever have with a single donor in my experience. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, and that, that's a reality of having, you know, being beholden to various sources for, for your revenue, which is uh, you, you may be asked to do things that are very onerous or not really central to your mission. I see what you that's mean. certainly yeah. true with federal funding, and uh -huh. it certainly has been true from time to time with, with so-called political strings that, that have been put on by the state appropriation process. So, uh, the, the the palliative, what is it? I mean, I guess, I guess it's to be very open and direct about uh, about what you expect, and very very clear in your articulation of what the mission mm -hmm. of the institution or the program is and how this gift fits into it. Well, let's talk about the, 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 the legacy fund. Right. Tell, me, tell me about the intent of this legacy fund for, uh, for the Knight gift. Yeah, I, I think in its broadest purposes, Steve, the, the intent of the legacy fund is to keep intercollegiate athletics in, independent of the, the need to, uh, 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 to utilize university funds, other private funds, for the support of athletic purposes, mm -hmm. just sort of generally. Mm -hmm. It will, because of its magnitude and because of, of the intent of the, of, of, the, of the donors in giving it, enable us to do construction for an arena in all probability. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't announce that yet because honestly mm -hmm. we're not ready to go, but, but clearly it, 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 it surmounts a major hurdle and, and it allows us right. to uh, do something to replace MacArthur Court, which frankly has outlived its time and sure. is a facility about which uh, you know everyone should be increasingly concerned. Right. Um, but even a hundred dollar gift is a hundred million dollar gift is going to give out give off how much per year, and and so where's the money going to come from to fund that arena if if the, if the if the endowment is not is not giving giving uh, giving off enough to to really get a, a huge start on yeah. it. Well, two things. Yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, it can provide a source of, of security to backstop the payment of, of uh, bonding, uh, mm -hmm. whether it's from public or private sources. So uh, it would guarantee, in effect, that it, if, if you have some, some bad luck, you still have an income stream. Mm -hmm. Second is that it, it's, it's what they call a quasi-endowment. That is to say, it, it is an endowment that can be used. You can invade the principle of it if you need to do that. So given that and really very modest uh, revenue projections of what an, uh, 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 an arena would, would generate um, is, a, in, in my view, a slam dunk. Mm -hmm. and, and a, a, a well, I guess we shouldn't use that expression <laughs> anymore <laughs> well, since Tenet used it. Of <laughs> uh, oh, that, that's uh, actually, WMDs, but yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. that, well, it, it's, a, it's a basketball term that yeah. I, I, I guess... I, I guess in use. this yeah. case it's yeah. appropriate. Yeah. Uh, actually, the, the, the president of our sister institution, Oregon State, when he heard this presentation at a State Board of Higher Education meeting, and, and he's an economist, a mm -hmm. very good one, as we know, um, volunteered that this was, this was uh, uh, as, as clear a business proposition from the standpoint of expected revenues mm -hmm. and how one retires debt as anything he'd seen. And I, I obviously welcomed the, the, the Beaver's view on this mm -hmm. be, because it was very genuine and, and, and spoken really in a supportive way, mm -hmm. and certainly not something you had to volunteer. Yeah. 
Well, that's uh, you know that's good news. Baseball apparently is back, and uh, we'll c come back to this issue. We've got uh, a new coach uh, with a four hundred thousand dollar salary, I believe. And again, uh, just to uh, ask you, uh, go back to these questions. What do you tell people who say, for example, that here you got coaches with these enormous salaries, mm -hmm. and we have a faculty salary issue? How, how do you how do you deal with that? issue when people ask you that question. And I know this is true, not just of our campus. It's, it's a, a nationwide phenomenon. Yeah. Sure, and I, Steve, I think you do it thoughtfully and, and with, with uh, recognition that in terms of the standard of living and, and how you want your faculty to live and the expectations you want them to have and, and the engagement you want them to have with the community and with the university, um, that's a tough sell. Uh, on the other hand, we're dealing with just very different markets. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, the the market tends to dictate the the outcome, and these are people who need to be successful or they are not employed. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, there's no such thing as tenure. There's no th and <laughs> there's very little in terms Good of point. of longevity at all. Uh -huh. So this is make it or find some other place. Mm -hmm. And and there's a very objective way. And you know, and sports pages, as you know, are very brutal. I think uncommonly so. Mm -hmm. uh, but th I think. That's at least some of the difference, which is that there, there's certainly nothing like job security. And, and for a person who's looking for a career, uh, and, it, and it rests on the uh, abilities and agility of people in the ages of 19 to 21, uh, that's a very different kind of market, a very different kind of set of expectations than we have. Does that make it easier to explain or maybe easier to swallow? No, mm -hmm. of course not. Mm -hmm. uh, let's just move from athletics for a while. That because we've, we've had donations for other other activities as well. Tim and Mary Boyle have donated, I think it's one and a half million dollars to found a new product design program for the School of Architecture. You want to say something about that? Yeah, because that's, that's really a cutting edge field that cuts across a whole range of human endeavors. Um, and you know, this is not just to be thought of as sort of throwaway consumer products. In fact, you know, some of the, 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 the most useful and high end ideas that we have about y utensils and things that we need mm -hmm. in our everyday life. Uh, th there's not very many places where there, people really focus on that uh, as a form of design, as, mm -hmm. as, as an in a need for intellectual inquiry, as a need for not only artistic expression, but, but actually uh, design that's friendly to the user in terms of how human beings interact. Um, so I, I find this very, you know, very exciting, innovative, it fits very nicely in in the interests of a, a lot of people who are uh, faculty in, in, in other fields, and it, and it brings those fields together in ways I think are going to be really very signature uh, for the U of O. Now, the other thing we're seeing all over campus that's really very extraordinary is this building that's going on. I mean, almost everywhere you, you look. You want to just tell us something about what's going on yeah. and how, how, it, how it's been possible, again, in this yeah. climate of, of such uh, skimpy support from the state. Yeah, well, I, th if there's one single thing that comes out of our interview tonight, and we've touched on many controversial subjects, of course, I hope it is some sense of shared pride that we have at the University of Oregon for this last decade of building and facilities construction. It is by any measure extraordinary. It probably will have overall as much an impact on the, on the University of Oregon and how it feels as did Ellis Lawrence's original design for the campus way back in the, the early part of the, of the 20th century. And what it's allowed is, is this enormous sense of, of growth and rejuvenation. And we're not, we're not finished by any means. In the last 10 years, even given the greatest recession since the 1930s in Oregon, with this huge cutback of public funding for everything, uh, in the span of that decade, we've constructed close to one half billion dollars of facilities at the University of Oregon. This despite a lousy uh, state appropriations picture uh, and everything else. Second point, three quarters of that, actually a little bit more than three quarters of that of those expenditures have been for academic facilities. So this urban myth that somehow our priorities are warped and this has all gone to uh, athletic edifices, it's just belied by, by uh, the evidence which is as clear as the buildings that are coming up all around mm -hmm. campus. Mm -hmm. And the third point, uh, really to, to your second question, uh, without private philanthropy, we could not have done this. Uh, we, we have uh, had conversations with people whose generosity is just nothing short of extraordinary. Uh, 
private philanthropy be built almost all of the Lillis uh, business complex, 40, uh, $47 million worth, $43 million worth. Uh, uh, half of the College of Education on which we've broken ground, half of the School of Music, which is now halfway through its being refurbished, uh, the uh, Integrated Sciences Facility, which is all underground, uh, completed in 18 months. Half of that was done because we had a lead gift in private philanthropy. A second science building that we're only $7 million away from being able to announce, $60 million facility. The lead gifts were private philanthropy. Mm -hmm. um, now, that doesn't mean we can always fall back on it, but it does mean that Campaign Oregon and, and our effort to reach out to donors, you know, who, who, whose intentions uh, you know, we, we had to examine earlier in this program, that's been the salvation of the University of Oregon. Mm -hmm. No one else, public or private, in the state of Oregon in higher education has had this kind of record mm -hmm. of, of rejuvenating its facilities. Do we have work to do? You bet. In faculty salaries, in student scholarships, our campaign's not over. But... Uh, this has been the signature event of the last decade, mm -hmm. and we've planned for it. Mm -hmm. We've gone after it, uh, and we have we, we have been successful in persuading people that this campus, this university, is really a gem, mm -hmm. and that it's worth the, the the donation of their charitable dollars in order to transform lives. They believe that. I believe it. It's true, and we're now seeing the fruition of these efforts, and and there's more to come. Now, in the minute or so we have left, and maybe have under a minute. Could you give us a sense of where the status of the of the drive for the the, the Oregon campaign is at the moment? Well, we're at about f five hundred and thirty million dollars of the six hundred million we want to raise. But we got the hundred million dollar donation in, in the umbrella of which we hope will uh, create the arena, um, and we have many unmet needs. I just mentioned mm -hmm. them: faculty support, uh, student scholarships. I want to blow by that six hundred million dollar goal. Mm -hmm. I have every confidence um, that we we will. Uh, to put an exact number on it, I'm not sure, because in essence, we're going to keep going after the campaign, raising money anyway. We need a new building for architecture and allied arts. We need uh, new student housing. We have the leverage money now to be able to, uh, to work on that. So I, I think things are, are bright. And certainly, if 10 years ago you'd said, would you have been able to do yeah. this now, I would have said impossible. Mm -hmm. But it's not impossible. Mm -hmm. So I, I, think our, I think our prospects actually are very rosy, and the campaign is going to be a big part of it. Very good. Well, Dave, it's been great speaking with you. Thanks so much for coming. Well, thanks very much, Steve. Nice to see you. <laughs> and we've been speaking with Dave Fronmeyer, president of the University of Oregon. Thanks very much for joining us.